In the uh, early days, heart failure was thought to be virtually synonymous with a uh, low ejection fraction. And if you didn't have the low ejection fraction, at least when I was starting, you didn't really have heart failure. You had something else. We now recognize, of course, patients have heart failure with preserved EF. And in point of fact, the majority of patients with heart failure have left ventricular ejection fractions, certainly above 35%, and the majority even above 50%. So back in the day, pivotal clinical trials, starting with the old consensus trial and the SOLVE studies, used LVEF as entry criteria for two reasons. Number one, to ensure that patients indeed had heart failure because there weren't other ways of looking at this objectively. We didn't have natriuretic peptides or any of the other aids that we use in defining heart failure. So to get in the clinical trial, the sine qua non was a reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. It was also assumed that the lower your ejection fraction, the higher your mortality. Structural characteristics, and this is uh, for Dr. Zogby in particular, um, we ought to be looking much more carefully at the structure of the myocardium. And the characteristics that we ought to be looking at include the size of the left ventricle. Left ventricular ejection fraction is important. We ought to look at flow and pressure characteristics, tissue tracking, and also tissue characteristics. We can determine things like the amount of fibrosis within the myocardium, and we ought to be doing that in categorizing our patients. This is some data uh, that uh, we actually put together many years ago when I worked with Mike Quinones. This is data from the old SOLVE study showing that structural abnormalities above and beyond left ventricular ejection fraction are important predictors of outcome. We really don't make any mention of that in our current categorization of patients with heart failure, yet left ventricular mass is a powerful predictor of how patients will do in the future. Prediction of mortality. Again, the registry data suggests that within the classes, there's no real difference in overall mortality, yet we lump them together and don't routinely predict mortality. There are a variety of ways of doing that. I've been working over the last couple of years with uh, collaborators at uh, UCSD trying to develop some predictive models using machine learning. <clears throat> and we came up with a risk prediction model that we term marker HF. And this uses eight readily ava uh, available variables uh, that you can get on virtually all of your patients. Their diastolic blood pressure, creatinine, BUN, hemoglobin, platelet count, albumin, and RBC distribution width, available in the electronic health record of virtually all of your patients. You can go online, and there's the website that you would use, and just plug those in, and you can categorize patients according to whether or not they have high, intermediate, or a low risk. And when we applied this to the categories of heart failure based on left ventricular ejection fraction, you can show sharp differentiation between their risk of future mortality, again, using eight simple variables. That's important information to us as clinicians when we're managing patients and how we direct their medical care, how we think about advanced therapy, how we think about palliative care, and so on. So let me finish up with an algorithm for the medical management of heart failure. We start out by defining heart failure due to the presence of the usual signs and symptoms. If they don't have it, pursue other management strategies. If they do have those symptoms, 
you look to see if they're congested. If they're congested, if they're not, end of story there. If they are, you treat them with diuretics. But in both cases, if they've got heart failure, you put them on an SGLT2 inhibitor. Again, no mention of left ventricular ejection fraction. You would also put them on an RNA, an MRA, and a beta blocker if they've got an ejection fraction below 50%. And I would strongly consider the use of an RNA in those individuals with an EF between 51 and 60. If they remain symptomatic and they have a low EF below 40%, I would then consider additional therapies like Verisiguad, Ivabradine, or hydralazine nitrate combination for special circumstances. This is a lot more simpler than the current recommendations in the guidelines,